Okay, um, good afternoon. Uh, let's start our lecture. So uh, last week we talked about how to find confidence interval for the means one mean mu or just mu one minus mu two. All right. So uh, today we continue with a special type of problems. We observed two observations, but they are not independent. They are from the same individuals, such as before and after. So um, we call this uh, dependent data. So, so you may have this is the observation before certain treatment. This is the observation of the same individual after treatment. Suppose they've gone through a, a diet a program. So before that, xi is the weight of this i individual, while yi is the weight of this individual after gone through this uh, diet program. So in this case, we would like to find out whether there's any difference in the means. But strictly speaking, what we are looking at is the difference between the two variables. All right, so the weight before the program and weight be after the program. So we look at the difference. So if there are no effect on the program, on the diet program, then we expect the expectation of this difference should be zero. All right, so uh, now the question is how to find a confidence interval for uh, the expectation of this difference. All right. Strictly speaking, you can treat this as a special type of the expectation of x <coughs> minus the expectation of y. But uh, this is a special type. It's not just a usual, the two different populations. <coughs> Here, we have only one population. The population is the differences. All right, we are looking at the differences. All right, we are looking at the average of these differences and try to find the confidence interval of differences, which to some extent is considered as the difference of the two means. But remember, this is a special case such that it's not the mu x and mu y are not from uh, two independent populations. They are from one population, the same set of individuals in this population. So for each individual, we look at two observations, before and after, usually. All right. OK, so, so in this example, we have 50 individuals taking a new diet, the weight before and weight after completion. All right. And so in this case, they are from the same individuals, so we consider it as a pair. So we have to use a different technique or method to find, to construct the confidence interval. All right, so basically looking at di, which is the difference between the observed, uh, the before and the after weight. All right, so to find the confidence interval for mu d, which here we assume, we assume that all right, they are normal, distributed, with mean mu d and variance sigma square d. And here, we assume that we don't know the variance of d. Now, it looks very complicated, but there are three main questions that you ask yourself all right, and then after you get the answer and then decide on what formula that you use to construct the confidence interval. Now this example of differences, basically you're looking at just one sample. One sample of the differences, D1 up to Dn. This is taken from a population which, first of all, we assume is normally distributed. All right, so normally distributed. Yes. Second one, we talk about whether you know the variance or know about the parameters. So
So here we talk about the population variance. Do we know? We don't know. All right. Then we are looking at the confidence interval for the mu, for the mean, for the mean. Okay. So the formula will be like this. It is the point estimate for this one. How you estimate the population mu d? So naturally, you will use d bar. That is the average of all these di's. That's the sample mean. All right, sample, the, the, the mean difference of this sample. All right, d bar. Then plus or minus a constant times the variation of this d bar. Or do you remember what is variance of x bar? It's sigma square over n. All right? But since we don't know sigma square, then what to do? So we estimate or guess. Estimate. Estimate by what? Obviously. Okay, I, uh, you may confuse about the notation. I try to make it. Uh, here I call it D, la, but in general it's just X. X. In general it's X1 up to Xn. All right? So we have the sample mean, we have the sample variance. So now I just replace the, the, D, the x by d's. So x bar replaced by d bar. So this s square, which is the sample variance, so we replace by the s d square. What's s d square? s d square is just, oh, okay, this is just 1 over m minus 1 submission x i minus x bar square which is based on the notation that we use is x. So here we used d. So it is summation of the difference between d i, each observation, away from the mean. And square it, and then divide by m minus 1. So this is my sd squared. Basically it's the same as this one. I just replaced the x by, f, uh, by d. All right? Over n. n is the sample size. Then take the square root. Because we are not looking at the variance, we're looking at the standard error, the square root of the variance. So now the, the problem is, what is this k? So in order to get this k, uh, in fact, because of the sigma square is not known, we estimate it, so this constant will be from the t distribution. This will be from t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. It's just one sample case. And alpha over 2. For 1 minus alpha uh, times 100% confidence interval. All right? So it's the same formula for the one sample case. You try to construct the confidence interval for the population mean mu. It's the same formula. Here it just replaced the the xi and yi by its difference. Why we can do that? Because the xi and yi are related. They're from the same individual. All right? They're related. They're paired. They're paired. And for the two sample or two populations case that we discussed, they are independent. So we have two populations. This population, we take one sample. This population, we take another sample. So they're not, the x and the y's are not related. But here, the xi and yi are related, all right? So let me ask you, although I did not discuss here. So what happens if this is known? If the variance, suppose I told you that, okay, the variance of the difference is a, is a number. I told you that number, so it's known. Then what should be the confidence interval? I still need this x bar as the estimate of the mu d, or the d bar, what I mean. How about the standard error part? So, if this condition is met, then we are looking at d bar plus or minus a constant times, should I use sd square here? Or should I use sigma d square? If this is known, which one should I use? Huh? 
Which one should I use? Sigma d square? Why? Uh? Is it obvious? Obvious, uh, so obvious. Uh. Because of course you know the answer, why you want to guess the answer, you are using the variation. So the variance, you know it's sigma d square over n for d bar. So you should use sigma square d if it's known. The problem is that when you don't know, oh, sir, sorry, I don't know. No, then you just guess. Guess, there are many types of guess, right? You just come up with, I like this number 7, so I put it 7. Fine, but I guess from the data that I got. So I get the guess, or I call it estimate from the sample. So we use the sample variance to estimate. So in this case, then it is sigma squared d, all right, uh, okay, over n. Ah, then how about this k? Then I will replace this by, you ask yourself, so since I don't estimate these variances, so in fact, d bar will follow a normal distribution. All right? So this will be z alpha over 2. No degrees of freedom, eh? no n minus 1, standard normal. All right? So for mean, whether it's mu1 or mu d or mu1 minus mu2. The formula basically is in this form. The point estimate plus or minus a constant times the standard error of this estimate. So the formula is like that. For mean, mu or mu1 minus mu2 or mu d. All right? So what is this variance? So usually it's sigma square over n, while for mu1 minus mu2, it will be sigma1 square over m1 plus sigma2 square over n2, and then there's a little bit more complication when sigma square are unknown, but we know that they're equal, then we have something slightly different. But basically the idea is like that. All right. What is this k? Depends on whether you know the distribution or not. So make it more complicated. So what happens if it is not normal? I don't know. But there's one thing that we can do. What is it? Huh? I mean, if we modify the sample size. Sample size. Huh? Sample size. That means the n. So whether it's big or not, large sample or not. Okay. Let me write it down here. Number three, number three. Large n. Then with this one, we don't need, I mean, okay. With this one, then at least we have this, uh, uh, some idea about the behavior of this x bar or the sample mean using this central limit theorem. All right. So if you know the underlying distribution is normal, then it will be a lot of things that can be done. But if the sample size is unknown to you, all right, then if the sample size is vague, then we can use this central limit theorem, apply it to x bar, the sample mean, the sample mean. Only the distribution of sample mean. Uh, I have to repeat this again and again. Uh. Big sample uh, does not mean that your samples follow normal distribution. All right. So x1, x2, up to x1 million, you have a sample size of 1 million. Does not mean that all these xi's are normally distributed. No, no, no. It is the average of these xi's, which I call it x bar. The behavior of this x bar will be approximately normal. All right? Now remember that central limit theorem applied to x bar, not individual x, ah. Think of it, I have a population, only have two values, zero, one, infinite number of them. So you take one million out of this population, you still have one million of values zero and one. How can zero and one follow a normal distribution? You only have certain values are zero, certain values are one. All right? So it's not normal. But the average, x bar, will follow normal, approximately normal, if your sample size is big enough. Okay? Alright. So uh, this is the D bar and uh, D 
This is the point estimate. So we use the T. So at the end, this is the formula. The confidence for mu D is D bar plus or minus the square root of the standard error. This is square root of S D square over N. Square root of it. And this is the T. Only the constant is the T. So as I said, if sigma, if you know this, all right, usually this is not the case, lah, but if you know that, then the idea is that the formula will be, the confidence will be given by D bar minus Z alpha for 2, sigma D over root N. And D bar plus Z alpha for 2, sigma D over root N. All right? So, uh, here is, so, if you have large sample, all right, then uh, this one, this one can be replaced by this. Uh, this part, uh, this part, we still assume the underlying distribution is normal, that the Ds are normally distributed. The only thing that we take this approximation, all right, because this, this two number is really, really, very similar if your sample size is big, all right? That means that uh, you can compare T, let's say 30, 0.025. What does this mean? Uh? This means it's a number here. This is the number such that greater than this number is 2.5% and the distribution is T 30 degree, all right? So this value, Compare with this value, 50, 0 0.025. Compare with T100, 0 0.025. Compare with T1000, 0 0.025. Uh, you, you, you seldom see people talk about 1000 because this number is very, very similar to this number. All right. So for example, Z, 0 0.025. You know what is this value? 1.96. So these numbers, these numbers, is getting closer and closer to this 1.96. So that's why when the sample size is big, we can just simply replace this by Z alpha over 2. Okay, of course, if you have a very powerful graphic calculator, you don't worry about it. But my point is, you have to understand the relationship between the standard normal and uh, and uh, t distribution. So t distribution with different degrees of freedom, you have different distribution, different shape. But the shape are uh, getting closer and closer and closer to standard normal as the degrees of freedom getting bigger. All right. So that's why I can do that. Okay. So this is the formula. Uh, so of course. How big is big, uh, the sample size? So here we accept n bigger than 30 as considered as big. Uh. But if you go and check, uh, there's still quite a big difference between the t value from 30 degrees of freedom and the standard normal. I think if we go to 100, uh, then it's, the difference is not that great. But here we assume that whenever we say sample size is big, all right, it's greater than 30. But this is only the rule that we used here. Huh? So uh, you have to persuade other people that think that this is really big uh, whenever bigger than 30. All right, so here's an example. Uh, we have 10 pairs, all right? Each member of the pair having approximately the same IQ. Now here, th in this example, in this example, is slightly different from what I just mentioned before treatment and after treatment for the same individual. Here, we are considering a pair. And within this pair, suppose the two individuals in this pair, we treat as one. In terms of IQ, they are similar IQ because we think that there may be some difference due to difference IQ. But we make sure that within this pair, they have the same IQ. All right, then we, we take one, from each pair at random, and then assigned to a, to a session using programmed materials. And the other one assigned to a session with yeah, professor lectures, right? 
So uh, maybe I change it to programmed materials that's like webcast, right? It seems that people like webcast, all right? At least uh, those are 10 lectures, uh, it's not too many, all right? So, uh, so in other words, the ideal case is that this individual, students, go through this um, programmed materials course, and then this same individual go through this, uh, yeah, bored by the professor, go through this professor's uh, uh, course, all right, and then find out the difference between maybe their test marks or exam marks or whatever. But it's hard to do that. So now we try to modify this idea. So these two individuals have the same IQ. Same IQ. So we treat it as equal in terms of the learning ability on things. Then one assigned to this program, the other assigned to another program. Then at the end, we check their, like for example, their exam marks or their test marks and see whether there's any difference. So, all right, so given the same exam and the results are record. So here's the record. All right, so, so this is minus five, eight, and so on. All right, so uh, some are positive difference, some are negative difference. All right. So we try to construct a 98% confidence interval from this. All right. Okay. So. So we calculate the D bar, which is minus 1.6. All right. So in other words, this, uh, uh, which one minus which one? Uh? Here, we are using this as X, this as Y. So we are talking about X minus Y. All right. So we try to construct the, um, now here, I say construct 95% confidence with true differences. The differences can be mu, okay, D can be X minus Y, or my Y minus X, all right? In this example, my D here is X minus Y. But this one, I did not specify which minus which, okay? It can be the program materials uh, minus the score from the lecture group, all right? So my point is, your answer, it doesn't matter whether you use this one or this one. At the end, the answer will be similar. So if the confidence interval that you get from here, let's say it's A, B, then the answer that you got for this one will be minus B minus A. All right, so the answer is not exactly the same, but you can get it from the, the other one. All right, so we don't know mu, uh, sorry, we don't know sigma, so we have to estimate it. So I got a pawn estimate. This one is used to estimate mu d, all right, or this number. And we also calculate the standard deviation or the, the variance. All right. Now, so, so because I don't know sigma, so I have to estimate and then use, I use t distribution. And don't forget, you have to divide this by two so that each n, share 1%, all right? Remember, is the probability of mu d between two numbers is equal to 0 0.02, 2%. 2%. So in other words, bigger than it, outside the range, outside this range, all right, should be 1% each, at each end. Half of 2%, so it's 1%. So that's why I look for 0 0.01. And the number, you can find it from table or from the sales table or from the calculator or from the Excel. All right, so the confidence interval, we apply the formula and this is the answer. So the difference between, the expected difference between X and Y or X minus Y is about minus seven to four, a quite a wide interval. Right? And this interval also covers zero. Zero. So in other words, it's likely that the mu d is equal to zero. In fact, 
mu d can be any values in between minus 7.3 or 2.92 and 4.092. But one thing, uh, why I can use this formula? Is the sample size big? The formula is derived from the distribution of d bar. If sigma square is not known, and the sample size is not big, we don't know the distribution of this one. Is our sample size big? 10 is not big, right? So what do we need? In order to know, we have to assume. I mean, you cannot assume this d bar, but we can assume d1 up to d10. We have 10 observations, right? Eh? Each from, from what? From a normal distribution, which is not state. All right, so you have to, all the work that hard work we, we did, uh, it's based on the assumption that this D, these, the differences, follow a normal distribution. All right? So, um, in fact, it simply means that the X, the X eyes, this marks here, this marks, or X1 up to X10, all right? are normally distributed, y1 up to y10 are normally distributed. Therefore, d1 up to d10 are also normally <coughs> distributed. All right? And when I say normal distributed, uh, I don't see these numbers. Uh, what I see is x1, x2, x3, up to x10. This number, 76, is just a realization of x1. All right? Uh, I keep telling you the realization, just like toss a coin. Before you toss, you don't know whether the outcome is head or tail. So it's a random variable. But once you toss it, then outcome realized. So you look at it, it is a head. So now the outcome is head. Okay, it's no more a random variable. So it's the same thing. So when we talk about the 10 um, test marks for these students gone through this programmed materials, all right, they are represented by x1, x2, up to xn. But th for this particular 10 students, okay, we have these test results. So the first one is 76, the second one is 60, and so on. All right? So uh, you have to distinguish it. So now, remember, all the work that we did are assuming that at least the di's are normally distributed, or the xi's and the yi's are normally distributed. Okay. Now we move on to a different type, variance, or ratio of variances. All right? That is sigma square and sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square. Okay? So, remember the three questions are population, or whether, it's one, whether it's normal distributed or not. Normal population. Second one, uh, use normal as an approximation because we, all the discussion are based on normal or not normal. We don't talk about other distribution. All right. Second one is the parameters. So in this case, since we are interested in the confidence for sigma square, so the other parameter, which is mean, whether it's known or not. All right. Of course, the third critical information that you have to decide is whether you have large sample size. All right? So, uh, first of all, when, when mu is known, Let me call it T square. All right. 
And what's the difference between these two? Uh? This is with mu. No. Then you can use this form. If mu are known, then this is useless. All right? So we estimate mu by x bar. That's our usual sample variance. So now, in the case that you know mu, then which, which one we will use to estimate sigma square? Of course, we use this one. Right? And do you remember what is the distribution of this one? So we have this distribution, all right? Now this is an important step in the de derived uh, formula. But uh, if you don't quite get the derivation, if the derivation is basically just finding the probability. So, but we need to know the distribution. We don't know, oh, we, 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 we don't know the dist, okay. Um, we know that, in fact, we know the distribution of this one. But if we divide by sigma square, all right, then it is bit, then it's a chi square with degrees of freedom n. And how about this one? It's n minus one s square over sigma square, which is nothing but just summation x i minus x bar square over sigma square. All right. Right, m minus one times s squared. You move m minus one over the other side, so it's like this. So this will follow a chi square with n minus one degrees of freedom. So my point is, depends on whether mu is known or unknown. In fact, usually, usually, the mu is not known to us. So that's why you seldom see the first, uh, the, the formula with mu known. All right, we should, usually we start with the sample variance. But I just let you know that there are different scenarios, mu known or mu not known. If mu known, so we should use mu instead of x bar because mu is the correct, is the answer. X bar is just an estimate. So we try to use the, the true value instead of just an estimate. So by that, by doing that, the distribution is slightly different. It follow a chi square, that quantity, follow a chi square distribution with n degrees of freedom. Okay, so remember, we need normal distribution, and in case this is no, all right, then it doesn't matter whether the sample size is big or not, all right? Oh, okay, here is the sample variance. We use this as a point estimate. This is in case mu is not known. If mu is known, use mu instead of x bar. All right? That's more accurate. Okay, case one is known. So uh, here I just repeat what I just mentioned. This is the, why we, how we got it is from here. Standardize it and then square it. Remember we, in chapter five, we mentioned the square of a standard normal, if this is standard normal, then square of it is a chi-square with one degrees of freedom. So this is a chi-square with one degrees of freedom. Then if you have W1 is chi-square 1, all right, and W2 is chi-square 2, uh, 1, WN is chi-square N, then the sum of all this will follow a chi-square distribution, sorry, 1, 1. Co uh, follow a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom n. So this is what we have. All right. So, so now, what I have to do is to get these two values. All right. This value, I call it chi-square n alpha over 2. This value, I call it chi-square n 1 minus 1 minus alpha over 2. Okay, just basically just two numbers, all right? Such that this probability is alpha over 2, this probability is alpha over 2. 
And my notation is that the first, in the subscript, the first argument is the degrees of freedom of this chi-square distribution. The second argument is the tail probability on, the, on your right-hand side. So this means that this is alpha over 2. This point means that bigger than this number, the probability is 1 minus alpha over 2. So in other words, less than it is alpha over 2. All right? Okay, so here it is. So this is the random variables between these two numbers, all right, with probability 1 minus alpha. So here is the rule. We want to find the confidence for sigma square. So we just rearrange these two inequalities. There are two inequalities here. Rearrange it with sigma square on one side. So we just multiply sigma square to this side. Just look at this one. Then it's equal to submission xi minus mu square divided by chi square and 1 minus alpha over 2. So that will be the upper limit of the confidence interval. Similarly, if you look at this confidence interval, uh, sorry, this inequality, then you will have the lower bound. So rearrange it, then you have this. So this will be our confidence interval with confidence level at 1 minus alpha. All right? But uh, usually this is not the formula that we use. Uh, we seldom have mu known. All right? So, so this is the confidence interval. All right? So how about unknown? If mu is unknown, then what we discussed just now cannot be used because we don't know mu. So we have to consider this one, all right? So I don't need mu, I just have this one. And this follow a chi-square with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, all right? So I just repeat what I just done. This time, I don't need the knowledge of mu. So this random variable, all right? That is, the numerator is just nothing but submission xi minus xr square. All right, look at this one, divide by sigma square, will between these two constants. Notice that, uh, this is n minus 1, uh, not n, uh, n minus 1. We lost 1 degree of freedom because we need to estimate mu by x bar. We use some of the data, the information in this n data to estimate x bar. So we lose one degree of freedom. So it's n minus one. So this is the confidence interval. In fact, this is the formula that we usually use because usually we don't know mu. All right. Now make sure that you know how to get these numbers. Huh? Two methods. Huh? You need to know how to get it from chi square table. That's the Dill's table. How to use the table that I uploaded. All right. And just in case, okay. usually it should be okay, but it's just in case if you don't find the exact uh, degrees of freedom appear in the table, use your own judgment, all right? Just take the nearest or take the average of the two nearest, all right? Then you get the value. You also need to know how to use your computer, your Excel to do it, all right? I think that's what tutorial 10, right? The first question asks you to compute all these values. Uh, so you should try both. Use the Tiff's table as well as use the computer. Of course, the third way is use your powerful calculator. Uh, all right, if you have one. The graphic calculator. Uh, I don't know whether ca graphic calculator can give you the chi-square value, the distribution chi-square. Huh? Normal, okay, right? T, okay, right? How about chi-square? Hey, have you used a graphic calculator before? For those who've gone through A-level mathematics, you know that, right? Okay, so this is the confidence interval for mu, uh, for sigma square when mu is unknown. All right, so um, here's the confidence interval for mu known.
So for mu unknown, you use this formula. All right, here is an example. We have uh, the volume of 10 cans of pitches. All right. Uh, they vary a lot, right? So these are the 10 observations. The, vo the, 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 the weight, sorry, um, the volume in deciliters. All right. Um, so we want to get an estimate of sigma squared, the variance of this uh, volume. All right. So each can has certain volume of these pitches, and we want to know the variation, sigma squared. So we observe 10 of them and try to get the confidence for, sig for, for sigma squared. All right. So to answer the first criteria, we assume that the normal, uh, the date, the volume, that means the random variable x, all right, x represents the volume. We assume that x follows normal distribution with mean, mu, and sigma square. We want to find estimate confidence for this one, and we don't know mu. All right. As you said, we don't know mu, estimate. So that's why we consider the sample variance. X is the volume, all right? So we assume this X follow normal distribution. That means this one. So we have the first criteria we know is normally distributed. So the second one, do we know mu? So read the question carefully. Never mention anything about mu. So we don't know mu. So in that case, we should use summation XI minus X bar square over sigma squared. All right. This is nothing but just M minus 1 times S squared. And this, all right, follow a chi-square distribution with M minus 1 degrees of freedom. Uh, if you don't know that, but you should pick up the right formula. What is the formula? The formula will be, will be summation XI minus X bar square or M minus 1 S square over, over what, huh? over chi square, n minus 1, huh? remember n minus 1, uh, 1 minus alpha for 2, and the lower n is xi minus x bar square over chi square, n minus 1, alpha for 2. All right. Okay? So, Here's the formula, compute the S square, and from the table is N equal to 10, so N equal to 10, N minus 1 equal to 9. So taken chi square 9, taken these two values. All right, so the confidence interval will be N minus 1 times the sample variance. All right. And the denominator, this is the chi square 9.025, and this is chi square, chi square 9, point o, sorry, point o 0.025, and this one is chi square 9, point o, point 0.975. Remember, my notation uh, is not universal, but the notation that we use in this, at least for these few chapters, it's referring to the upper tail, the, the probability on the right-hand side. So this means that for a chi-square distribution with 9 degrees of freedom, then this pawn is 2.7. And greater than this, the probability is 97.5%. So that's what we mean by 2.7, 97.5%. All right, so this referring to this. While this 19.023 is a pawn here, 19.023, and this pawn, the probability greater than it is about 2.5%. All right? Okay. So, how about two population variances? So, if normally distributed or approximately normally distributed, while sigma 1 square and sigma 2 square are known, then 
All right, so, so remember, the first one, normal, assume yes, both of them. Second one, meal, meals are known or not? No, we don't know. One is sample size, but if, you, if this is yes, uh, then whether n large or not, is, it doesn't matter. All right? If you have normal distributed. But if you don't have normally distributed populations, then the sample size may be a consideration. Big sample may help us. All right? All right, so here, so we work out. This follow a chi-square, this follow a chi-square, and they're independent. Therefore, we take the ratio. This is a chi-square, random variable, with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom. Divide by the degrees of freedom. This is from chapter 5. Huh? And this is chi-square, n2 minus 1 random variables, divide by n2 minus 1. So the ratio of this and this, okay, is a F distribution with N1 minus 1 and N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. The ratio of this and this will follow a F distribution. All right? To make it easier, it simply means that if this is a chi-square random variable divided by its degrees of freedom, and if this is another chi-square distribution with, with this as the degrees of freedom, then this is an, a random variable which follow a F distribution with N and M degrees of freedom. Why we need to know all this? Because that's how we calculate the probability based on which we can derive the confidence interval. So, random variable follow a F distribution and these are the two numbers such that this random variable falls between these two numbers with probability 1 minus alpha. All right? So what I wrote down here is referring to this picture. F distribution with degrees of freedom N1 minus 1 and N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. This is the point here, such that the probability greater than this number is given by alpha for 2. So that is, this is alpha for 2. This is another constant. I notice that they're not the same. Huh? This is 1 minus alpha over 2. Huh? This is alpha over 2. So this is the pawn. This is the pawn here. Such that the probability greater than this number is 1 minus alpha over 2. So in other words, less than it is alpha over 2. All right? Less than it is alpha over 2 for, for this number. So again, we just have to rearrange it so that sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square is the only term on the one end of the inequality. Here it's not, huh? but we try to rearrange it. So this is how we arrange it. So it becomes sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square in the middle. Uh, in one end of the inequality, the rest I put it on the other side. So it becomes like that. Okay, uh, Okay. Uh, I think from Statue's table you can get this value, but we don't have this value, all right? Then, so we have to make use of the knowledge about this. So. Remember I say V over N, W over M, this is F distribution with M, N degrees of freedom, right? Then, what can we say about this? What is the distribution of this one? Is it the same distribution? Cannot be, right? They are not exactly the same there. This is a chi-square. This is also a chi-square. The degrees of freedom is m in the numerator and degrees of freedom is n for the denominator. So this will follow f distribution with the first parameter is m and the second parameter is n. They're not the same distribution. 
So you can see that this is just take the reciprocal. If I call this f, then this is nothing but just similar to 1 over f. So in other words, if we, we take 1 over uh, f distribution, then the distribution is uh, an f distribution again. But the degrees of freedom swap. All right? So now, so he, here we say that if I want to find this number, which is follow an f distribution with these two degrees of freedom, all right? So, so just rewrite it again. So this is f n1 minus 1 and n2. And then we want to find this number such that greater than this probability is 1 minus alpha for 2. All right, so now let me write it like this. So probability of, all right, uh, f greater than this number, let, let me, okay, uh, let me call this a, uh, call this number a. So the probability is 1 minus alpha for 2. This is uh, n1 minus 1, all right, 2 troublesome. Two. Let, let me call this n and this m. Uh, so it's m and n. All right. So now I take the reciprocal. 1 over m, uh, f, n and m. This becomes 1 over a. Right? Lost already. Wow. So another one over, then uh, you lost, right? Let's get back to the original one. <laughs> okay, so this is less. Am I right? Take one over, then you receive. So it's one minus half of two. All right. Uh, okay, then, but this, what, what is this? What, what is this? This is nothing but just f m n. 1 over f n m is the same as f m n. All right, just swap the inequalities. So therefore, 1 over a, I want it less than this number, so 1 over a should be the same as f m n. All right. Um, F M N. This value less than this number is one minus alpha per two. All right. So I found a find a value, this value, such that the probability less than it is one minus alpha per two. That means greater than it is alpha per two. So this is alpha per two. All right. Okay. You lost, right? So now we just forget about all this. Just look at the answer. The answer is that if you want to find this critical value, which is on this side, then you just have to find the value, all right, for uh, another F distribution with the degrees of freedom swap. All right. So instead of finding for example, if I want to find this value with 2 and 4 degrees of freedom, and this is 0.95, for example, I want to find it. This is not in the statistical table. So I make use of the relationship that I mentioned, discussed here, and you don't get it, but just look at it. It's equal to 1 over F, 4, 2 degrees of freedom and 1 minus this one. So it is 0 0.05. So now I look at, instead of 0 0.95, I look at 0 0.05. 1 minus that, but I swap, I swap the degrees of freedom, all right, and take the reciprocal. Okay? You need some practice, lah. So the formula is okay, but how to, uh, so we can see that now this one now change. All right. 
the original formula should be 1 over f, some f value. But because we don't know, it should be, this one should be f n1 minus 1, n2 minus 1, and 1 minus alpha of 2 degrees of freedom. All right? So this is the original formula. But instead of using this one, try to look for a value from another distribution. The degrees of freedom, just swap these two and look for 1 minus that number. So it becomes the alpha of a 2. All right? If you lost in all this, uh, just take some numerical example, the one that I just wrote down. F24. Sorry, F24 and PON025. This one you can read out from the table. This one. It's not given in the table. So huge, eh? or the value in fact is very small. You cannot find value. So this is equal to 1 over 1 over 4, 2. Look for a distribution, F distribution with degrees of freedom 4, 2 and 0.025, 1 minus this. So this is the value and take the reciprocal. That will be the value that you're looking for. And why we have to achieve, why we can do that? Because the F, do you just, F with A and B degrees of freedom is the same as 1 over F of B, A. These two random variables, one is F with A, B degrees of freedom, the other one is F with degrees of freedom, B, A. These two random variables are not the same, but F, a, B is equal to the 1 over F, B, A. And the reason is the one that I just mentioned. It's like that. If you swap it, it is again an F distribution, but only the degrees of freedom swap. And one is the reciprocal of the other one. All right. So if you don't get this part, just remember this. Not remember, but just realize that this is how you get the other F value. All right, so here it is. So, uh, okay, this is the one that I just explained. All right, so uh, you see, degrees of freedom, and this is the probability. This is the whole thing greater than this with such probability. So it's one first, what two degrees of freedom, and then one minus one minus this number. So it becomes alpha for two. So remember F two four point oh five is equal to one over F four two. Swap this two. Oh, sorry, point nine five. We are looking at this number, point nine five. Then this is point oh five. Alright? So just remember that. 2, 4 is just arbitrary. Alright? Just swap it. It becomes 4, 2. Then, remember mu 1, mu 2 not known. Uh. Yeah. So what happens if you know mu 1 and mu 2? Haha. Uh? <laughs> In fact, it's not too difficult. If you understand what we are saying, but I don't know how much you understand. So you can think of it, mu1, mu2 unknown. Then if you based on what we just discussed, uh, so you should not use S1 square and S2 square, but instead you should use this. Right? This one is chi square, n1. Then this one, Sigma 2 squared, sigma 1 squared. So this is chi squared and 2. All right? So 2 chi squared, but this time the degrees of freedom is slightly different. Forget about this one. Uh, all right? I don't think that's so difficult in the exam. Uh, all right? But just help you to understand the difference. So if mu 1 and mu 2 are known, so we just replace it by 
instead of using x bar and y bar, we use mu1, mu2. Because of that, it's no more a chi square m n1 minus 1, a chi square m2 minus 1. In fact, it is chi square n1 and chi square n2. Then the rest are similar. So the formula will be slightly different. All right? Okay, so we, this is the formula that we just mentioned, huh? with mu1, mu2 unknown. Huh? So uh, here is the example, and you see, make it 98%. Uh, this is not the usual confidence level. Huh? The usual confidence level is 95% or 99%. And we ask for 98% because the table that we provide is about 1%. All right? So each side 1%. So this is the value for which this is 1%. So the other side is 1%. So all together add up to 2%. So that's why we, the middle part, this part is 98%. So that's why I asked for 98%. If I ask 99%, then this one will be 0.5%. This side is also 0.5%. So you have to look for this value in your statistics table. Or use your computer to get it. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, it's important. Huh? Without this one, huh? I don't know what to do. All right. So here we assume that it, data are normally distributed. So what we discussed, the formula, the chi-square, the F distribution, all this can be applied because they are based on the normality assumption of the first sample and the second sample. Or the first population and the second population are all normally distributed. We base All right? So we just substitute and uh, formula. Oh, there's some complication here. Uh, we, need, we need this. And uh, it happens that it's not in the statistical table. If you use the same table, all right, or in the exam, then what to do? All right. Um, so, uh, okay. So here, I take the average. All right. Okay. What I'm trying to say is that you may not have this value have F2412 and F2424. Uh, I forgot exact value. So what I mean is that this case, at least the first one match. Then maybe you take the average of these two values, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. All right? Now what happens uh, if this 24 is not there? You only have this 24... Uh, Okay, I, I, I forgot that. So suppose I only have this. <coughs> huh? uh, yeah, okay. So 15 is somewhere between 12 and 24. 24 here is between 18 and 30. All right? So what to do? So uh, don't worry about it. Just take any possible make sense solution. One is take the average of the four, uh, because you have the four corners, right? Your value is somewhere in the, in, in the cent not in the center, but somewhere. So you just take the average of these four values. All right? Or you want to more accurate, you do a interpolation, but it's too complicated. <laughs> So what I suggest is that, okay, if you think that average of four numbers is too complicated, just take the nearest one. Which is the nearest one? 24, 15? Oh, 24 is somewhere between 18 and 30, right? Yeah. <coughs> 15. <coughs> 15. 15 is closer to 12 than 12, all right? So I take this one or this one. It doesn't matter. Or you just take the average of these two. All right? So, so long as it makes sense, 
it doesn't matter. So, so don't worry about it. Don't try too hard on it. Because once you have the computer, <coughs> you can get the value easily. So this part is just to do the linear interpolation. Uh, all right. So this is the answer. All right. All right. <coughs> so uh, this is another one. Uh, just now, I got a confidence interval for this. So between two numbers, two random variable, random interval, is 1 minus alpha. So I just take the square root of all this. So I take the square root of these two numbers, then it will be the confidence interval for sigma 1 over sigma 2. All right? OK. So let me just, just summarize. So what we have discussed so far, uh, maybe use this. this um, uh, OK, Let, let's start a new. Okay, so, so we want to find uh, estimation. Then we also have this sigma or sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square. Yeah, I did not mention that. Huh? How about sigma d squared? So in fact, this one is the same as this one. This one is the same as this one. All right, so I can forget about it. But just make sure that you understand that it is a paired sample. Although you see two numbers or two set of numbers, but they are related. In that case, you just look at the difference. And in that case, it reduced to one population case. All right? So. Check this. Whether you have normality assumption, whether the other parameters are known or not, because well, our discussion is based on mu sigma square. So whether one of them are known or unknown. For these two, so we look at whether sigma square or sigma 1 square, sigma 2 square are known. Then we also look at whether sample size is large. All right? Now, for mu, maybe forget about this. So, for mu, then, if it's normal, we use x bar. All right? And, uh, okay, for 1 and, okay, no. No. Sorry, uh, this one, um, okay, let me start over again. Mu and mu1 minus mu2. All right, first one is normal. And uh, um, whether, for this case, whether sigma known or sigma1 square, sigma2 square known. All right, known. The third one is whether n is large. Now, for this case, if you have normal distribution, you have uh, oh, uh, known variance, all right, then it doesn't matter whether the sample size is big or not. The confidence of x bar plus or minus z alpha for 2 sigma over root n. That's the confidence interval. Okay, how about only one normal distributor and we don't know sigma? Then the formula will be T n minus 1 alpha over 2 sigma over root n. All right. Now, what happens if we don't have 1? We only, we don't have, we don't know sigma square. We only know 3. Then we use this one. Uh, 
Sorry, uh, this is not sigma. This should be S. Uh, sorry, uh, S. Okay, then this is something like that. Why? Because when n is big, we don't need the underlying distribution is normal. We just approximate. Uh, uh, this is only an approximate confidence interval. Okay, two uh, a is uh, they are known, and also two b is that whether they are equal or not. All right. So, for this case, if it's normal distributed, if all the sigma one, sigma two square are known. All right, but unknown. We don't know the value, but we know that they are equal. So for the case 2, A, then this is my point estimate, plus or minus, plus or minus, the standard error will be sigma 1 square over n1 plus sigma 2 square over n2. Take the square root, and this will be z alpha over 2. All right? Okay, so if we have 1 and we have 2b, that means we don't know sigma. We don't know sigma. We don't know sigma 1, we don't know sigma 2, but we know that they are equal. Then it will be x1 bar minus x2 bar plus or minus all right, t n1 plus n2 minus 2 square root sp square 1. This is basically an estimate for sigma square, which is the weight the average. Weight the average. That means n1 minus 1 s1 square plus n2 minus 1 s2 square divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2. All right? So, what happens? We don't know one. And, uh, N1, N2 are large. All right? Then, then what is it? So it'll be x1 bar minus x2 bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 square root s1 square over n1 plus s2 square over n2. Right? We don't need normal assumption. Once the sample size is big, we just take an approximate, a, approximate distribution. Yeah, don't take picture. You derive it yourself. Recall it and revise, and then write down the formula in your help sheet. Right. By the way, uh, I may intentionally or unintentionally make mistakes here, so double check. Uh. So don't just just print out the photo uh, uh, as part of your help sheet. Uh. Ah, I purposely make a mistake there. Uh. But it's just so joking. I try to make it correct, but sometimes I may overlook. All right, so you double check. So what I'm trying to tell you is that there are few conditions. So different conditions will give you different formulas. One very important one is the normality assumptions. All right, if that is not given to you, but the sample size is big, then you can use the central limit theorem, apply to all these sample means, so you can get an approximate. Then the another difference is whether you know the other unknown parameters, whether you know sigma uh, mu or you don't know mu. So here's another one, right? Sigma square and sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square, right? So now, uh, we still have normal. Uh, second one, whether mu is known or not. And third one, whether n is large or not. All right? So if it's normal and if mu is known, then the formula um, somehow it's known, so it's submission xi minus mu square divided by um, chi square n alpha over 2, and the other one is xi minus mu square chi square n 1 minus alpha over 2. All right? So this is the confidence interval. So what happens if we, we don't know mu? Then, easy, la. replace this by x bar, 
replace this by n minus 1. Uh, purposely leave it not so clear. So we make sure that you, when you have only 1, but you don't know mu, then you have to replace the mu by x bar. By doing so, it's not chi square n anymore. It's chi square n minus 1. All right? And uh, here I don't mention about n is big, huh? so uh, forget about it, right? Okay, then the next one, <laughs> ratio. So this one, so obviously, uh, if you have 1 and 2, then it's submission xi minus mu 1 square over summation yi minus or yj minus mu 2 square, right? Uh, yeah, th th this one divided by n, divided by n1 minus 1. This one divided by n2 <coughs> minus 1. Right? S1 square over S2 square. All right, look at this quantity. Oh. Oh, okay. I remember. So it's S1 square over S2 square, right? 1 over, because we just want the answer, right? Everyone likes the answer. Forget about the middle, in the midday steps. So this is the answer. N1 minus 1, N2, oh, sorry, 2, uh, mu 1, mu 2, no, uh, so it's N1. Uh, oh, I, uh, this is correct. This is wrong. All right? Why? Uh? Don't know. Uh? This one is xi minus x bar. You use x bar. I say 2 is known. Mu is known. Or mu 1, mu 2 uh, is known. All right? So in that case, so you replace this. So it be summation xi minus mu 1 square. This one, so, so, so this one you have to divide by m1 minus 1. So this is summation yi minus mu two square, n two sorry, no no minus one, just n two right. So uh, so what's the constant here? F n two n one alpha for two. This psi. If I call this A, uh, so the lower case is A over 1 over N1, N2, alpha over 2. All right? This one is when you mu 1, mu 2, no, uh, but I don't think I give that formula. So you just have 1 for this case. You have only 1. Then the formula is s1 square s2 square 1 over f n1 minus 1 n2 minus 1 alpha over 2 the upper limit is s1 square over s2 square f n2 minus 1 n1 minus 1 1 uh, alpha over 2 without the reciprocal eh? the formula is given and this formula is just copy from this Replace the n1 minus 1 by n1. Replace the n2 minus 1 by n2. Replace the s square. s square need x1 bar. I don't need that. I know mu1. So I replace mu x1 bar by mu1. x2 bar by mu2. So that get the formula. Uh, usually we don't use it. We, we, we don't know mu1, mu2 usually. So that's why that's the formula is more pop. The second pop. With the s1 square, s2 square is the formula that we use. Okay? All right? Okay. Uh, this is just for you to think about it. Uh. Write down your conditions, write down the formula, and make sure that you understand the formula so that you can use it all right, correctly. Okay, I still have a, a few minutes. So, This one, uh, I can go very fast because hypothesizing and the confidence level basically is 
just the same problem with two faces. But of course, there are some new ideas here. I don't know whether you heard before about this p value. Huh? Have you heard about p value? Hmm? It's very important as a sort of golden rule of a lot of research. Whether you want to reject, whether you want to establish something, you say the p value is so small, we reject the null hypothesis and things like that. But, uh, okay, so this is what we are going to do. Remember, we are, the discussion that we are going to, to have are based on normal distribution. If it's not normally distributed, we need to have a big sample size. All right? All right, type 1, type 2 error. Level of significance. And then, basically, we are talking about hypothesis testing concerns about the mean, about the variance, about the difference in means. So basically, it's mu, all right? And mu 1 minus mu 2, and sigma square, or sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square. Hypothesis. What is hypothesis? Hypothesis is just a statement with a truth value. That means it's either true or false. All right? So, so, if I make a statement, all right, I'm an old man. So it's either yes or no. So to me it's yes, la. I'm old enough, la. hold a senior card, all right? But if I'm asked, am I an old man? Of course, that's yes or no to this question. But this question, this question does not have a true value does not have true or false, all right? So, hypothesis is a statement that have true or false value. So, remember, you can say yes or no. So, okay, in hypothesis testing, we are just have a statement that can be true, can be false, and we don't know whether it's true or false. So, we try to look at the data, collect the data, so that we try to draw a conclusion or make a decision. So, for example, I say that this class has a CAP equal to 4.5, all right? So this statement can be true, can be false. So if I want to find out whether it's true, I go and take out all the CAP of all the 500 students in this, not this, uh, this module, and then take the average. That is a true answer. I don't know that, all right? So I take a sample, all right? Uh, Straight speaking, it should be random sample. But if I do not take a random sample, I just take this class. Uh, so uh, well, those are 10. Uh, get the CAP if you want to tell me, right? So I then take the average. I use that as an estimate. I can construct my confidence tool. All right? But now I look at my sample. I try to calculate something. And based on that, I make a decision. And I say that based on that, for example, let's say my CAP of the sample of, let's say, 20 students that I select out of this 500, Let's say the CAP average of these 20 students is 4.8. Wow. Do you believe that the average is 4.5? Okay. Maybe hard to see. Huh? Okay, suppose I take 20 students and the CAP is 2.5. Then do you believe that the whole class has an average of 4.5. You still cannot, don't know, right? Do, okay, if the CAP of my 20 students, the average is, of this 20 student, CAP is 2.5. Do you believe that this group of students come from uh, 500 students, or these 500 students have an average CAP equal to 4.5? What do you think? Yes? Okay, 2.5 is not good. Eh? I extend it eh, to CAP only one. The average of my 20 students is one. So do you believe the CAP of the whole group, whole population is 4.5? Huh? Very different there. Eh? One and 4.5. But the answer is I don't know. All right? Why I don't know? Because it depends on the variations. All right? 
this difference is very big. Right? The x bar, which is 2 or 1, and the true answer is 4.5. The difference seems to be very big. All right? But you have to take into consideration the variations. So that, that's why it makes it a little bit more complicated. All right? Now, even based on, based on this, um, the average, my sample mean uh, is 2.5, let's say. Then I make a decision. I don't believe that, the statement. All right? I make a decision, but I still cannot prove or disprove the statement whether the CAP is 4.5 unless I check everyone and I get the answer. So if based on this sample and I draw a conclusion, the conclusion, all right, I'll make a decision, 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 is to whether I believe that statement or I do not believe in that statement. Okay, um, I, I just want you to make sure you understand that in hypothesis testing, it's not a proof of the statement, it's just the decision that you make. So your decision is whether you believe that or you don't believe that. For example, in a park, all right, and I make a statement, there's no bird in this park. Okay, so if you see one bird, immediately you can decide that this statement is false, all right? But if I don't see any bird at the point that I left, do you believe that this statement is always true? If so, I just don't, when I visit that part at that moment, I don't have the evidence to say that there's no bird. So I only see no birds, but does not mean that statement is true, all right? So, wow, funny, eh? All right? So, my point is, it's all your decision, all right? It is your decision to reject or do not reject. So, yeah, in English, uh, do not reject, that's not, it's equivalent to accept, right? But for hypothesizing, we do not use the word accept. Okay, you can accept it, but it does not mean that the statement is true. It's just based on whatever we see, and we do a lot of things, and then we make a decision that we, we believe that the statement is, I mean, we, we do not reject the statement. All right? So that means I go there and see no birth. So that statement is believable, but, but we don't know whether it's really true. All right? But if you see one bird, then you can reject that statement with 100% confidence because statement is false already. All right. So that's why this type 1, type 2 error. All right? So... There's this possibility. A statement, I call it H0, is true. And then another scenario is that it's false. Hey, I'm still here. What? You're so eager to go. My tutorial. H0 is true. So you make a decision. Uh, this, is, this is the nature or the answer, which we don't know, the nature. And the other one is your decision. You can make the decision. You believe H0 is true or H0 is false. If the nature H0 is true and you make a decision, you make a decision, then okay, huh? you are right. Big take. But what happens if H0 is true and then you make a decision, you don't believe that, you reject the null hypothesis. Then you have made an error, right? Because the answer is there, and then you don't believe the answer. You don't believe in that statement. You reject that statement. So it's a false. But on the other hand, if H0 is false, H0 is false, all right? Then if you reject it, you make the right decision. Correct? But if you do not reject it, well, the answer is H0 is false. The statement is, is false. And then you do not reject this statement. That means you make an error. Wrong. All right? So there are two scenarios, I mean, two possible errors. Are they the same? They're not the same, right? So 
we distinguish it um, so called one and two la. which one is more important which one is more important so usually we don't want to we don't want to we don't we want to make we, we won't have a status code. We don't want to make any changes. So we try to protect the null hypothesis in some sense. So in other words, we try to look for strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So this is more important to us. We call it type 1 error. This one is not, it's also important now, but compared with the first one, it's not so important, we call it type 2 error. You think of it as like this, like in the court of law, in the court of law, all right? Anyone go in front of the court of law, everyone accused is assumed innocent. Then the prosecutor or the team try to prove that he or she is guilty. All right, so they look for, they show a lot of evidence to the judge or to the jury that this accused is guilty. All right, but even very, very strong evidence, a lot, a lot of evidence, there's still slight chance that the accuser will be judged as um, guilty, but in fact, he is innocent. So in that case, we make an error. Because he is innocent, and then prove after all this hard work, then the, the judge uh, conclude that he is guilty. So we commit error. So it's very serious. On the other hand, on the other hand if the accused is guilty, it, the truth is he's guilty, all right? And then this prosecutor tried to show that, that he's guilty, but failed. So the judge said, that, okay, now you, you can go, you are innocent, you can go. So we make a mistake. It's also serious, but it's not as serious as the, 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 the first one. So there are two types of error. So long as your answer, your decision is different from the true answer. So in the setting, so long as your conclusion, whether you reject, or do not reject the null hypothesis, contradict to the status, the nature of the null hypothesis, then you commit a mistake. So we have this type 1 and type 2 error. Sorry to keep you here. Okay, we, stay here, we stop here and then continue Thursday. And